and good afternoon. My name is Mandy O'Neill. I'm an associate professor at George Mason University just outside Washington, DC. This year, I'm a visiting scholar at University of California, Berkeley, the Haas School of Business. It's wonderful to be your moderator today. I'm going to later introduce my wonderful co-presenters today. And I'm going to start out today talking about culture and in particular, its importance in building the case for culture, but also the importance of building and maintaining a positive culture. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna go through a lot of slides. I'm a professor, so you're gonna feel like you're back in school again a little bit. We're gonna get some graphs, but I'll, I'll walk you through them just to give us an overview of where we're talking, and then I'll turn the stage over to our wonderful presenters to talk about their work at their firms, particularly in the area of diversity and inclusion. So, what do we mean by culture? This is a word that could mean everything in the kitchen sink. It could be nothing. It could be norms. It could be assumptions. I'm going to give you two metaphors to think about today. And at the end of the talk, you can decide which one you like better. Um, but one way of thinking about culture is just whatever is on your badge, whatever's around the organization, whatever the CEO tells you it is, whatever you think it is. So it could be something as simple as that. You know, I sometimes see people when I ask about the culture of their firm, they look down at their badge and, you know, it's worrisome when they can't remember what's on the badge. But, you know, what I'm going to talk about today actually goes far beyond what's on the badge to think about culture in terms of all of its manifestations. So a metaphor that we use a lot is one of the icebergs. Some of you may have seen it before. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to actually subvert that a little bit and suggest that we need to rethink that metaphor. But suffice to say that what's on the badge might be just one level of culture and maybe the one that's most visible, but doesn't actually reflect what's most interesting and powerful about culture, which is what's underneath the surface. So that includes the taken for granted aspects of it, the part that we can't necessarily articulate. Sometimes it takes trained facilitators to really get out of, you know, what's underneath there that most of us know but, but can't necessarily articulate. If we complicate that a little bit, um, as I've done in my own work, we start thinking about culture in an entirely different way. So I've spent the past 10 years, um, this is an HBR article, my co-author and I wrote on the idea that culture has also in neglected another important aspect, which is the emotional aspect. So the employees' emotions, what they bring to work, what they're expressing, and how it feels to be at that organization at really every level of culture. So if we think about that in terms of why it matters, a lot of us are in this room because we've been in sort of dysfunctional cultures or cultures that need to change with the times. This is actually a famous scene um, from 12 Angry Men, which is a, a movie about how weird things happen when groups get together and decisions are made. And what we all want to move towards a culture that's something like this. And, um, you know, those of us in California wish that we could actually get to something like this. Um, <laughs> Doesn't seem it's going to be happening. When I wrote these slides, we, we didn't know if it was going to happen or not, but we'll see. Um, so if we, if we actually think about the past 10, 15 years of culture research, a new metaphor suggests itself as being useful. And, and this metaphor differs in two ways. One of which is this is a flower and it's living. So culture is a living creation of the people and the institutional structures and the history and everything else. And similarly, it can thrive and it can blossom and bloom or it can die and it can wither. But what it means if we start looking at it from this different perspective that I'm suggesting here is that the outward visible aspects of culture are more important than we could have imagined, which includes who we see and how we see them every day we go into the office. So that includes the facial expressions, includes who's working there, and also what's underneath, which does include those deep roots, the history, the implicit assumptions. Okay, so so what? I mean, this is a question we have to ask a lot, especially in business schools. Like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, that's cool, but like, so what? So we spend our time when we're not here, when we're not teaching, actually doing research to demonstrate the so what. One of the things that we've concluded, and this is a graph from an article that uh, I'm told is, is better than, you know, most sleep aids if you actually try to read it, is that... <laughs> Culture matters for a lot of things. So on this slide, we found some evidence that culture matters for things we track like employee attitudes, so job satisfaction, engagement. It also matters for the clients. So this is in a healthcare context. We actually demonstrate the impact of the staff culture on the patients, both health, well-being, trips to the emergency room, you know, things that have dollar signs in it that we're tracking. But then most interestingly and most profound, I think, is that it actually rippled out to the ultimate clients, which in this case were the family members. So if you think about your own businesses and think about not just the investors, but if we take it one step further, who else might be impacted by the culture of our firms in ways that we never really thought about? Our research shows that it actually matters for all those other constituents. 
some parts of culture seem like they might be incompatible. So you may have heard about supportive cultures, people-oriented cultures, caring cultures. We sometimes call it, we sometimes use the L word in our research, love, affection, tenderness. Um, does that exist in competitive results-oriented industry? I mean, it's one thing to say in healthcare it matters because they're in the business of compassion, but what about results-oriented companies where you know, we have stakeholders that have very, very serious bottom line objectives? What does that look like? Well, let me tell you why it matters. So this is a live action poll. I could have done the same thing with all of you where everybody had their clickers and I asked them to describe the one word that describes their emotional culture. Now, for all of you non-millennials in the room, this is a wordle. Um, what wordles mean is that the, the large size of the word is how often people use that word. So when, without any prompting, when asked to describe the culture, people describe the anxiety and stress that they felt. So in, in the goal of moving toward a positive culture, we have to deal with the negative as well. We have to deal with the anxiety. Well, we've got a research solution for that too. What we found here, and this is the, this is the school part of it, what we found is that that line that's going down is costs. So what we found is, you know, anxiety is not always necessarily a bad thing. And in some level, you actually want people to have the fire in their belly, the motivation, the desire to stay there and get the job done, the caring about the client and their best interests. But when you don't have a culture of caring and support, then suddenly costs can be very, very problematic. And that anxiety that I talked about can be really, really impactful for the bottom line in a negative way. When you have a culture of caring, love, affection among the staff, suddenly it buffers the negative effects of that stress. So that's one reason. Okay, what does that look like? And, you know, let's go to the most extremely competitive results-oriented place I've ever worked with, which is a global semiconductor firm, uh, publicly held. The first thing I discovered in doing this research is that they use the same metaphor that every other culture in every industry uses, which is family. So they say, you know, the times are tough, it's not good, it's really hard, but when the times are tough, we band together. We have a camaraderie. We get through the tough times by taking care of each other. And it helps us with the, the really anxious part of our job. Same metaphor I see in every single industry. Okay, so we're here for a diversity forum. I know, what does that mean to have a culture that's both positive, but it also contributes to our interest in a global, defer, diverse, inclusive workforce? Well, let me give you sort of a correlate here. The first is that inclusion is different than diversity. So we've moved beyond body counts and quotas to a culture where we feel we can bring our true, authentic selves to work. And as you'll see on the panel today, we're going to talk about diversity in very different ways than the traditional ways we've been talking about it. But importantly, though, this is not just having a body count. This is having impact. So the metaphor we sometimes use is not just being invited to the party, but actually being asked to dance and to demonstrate that you have impact and meaningful purpose in the organizations. Um, not being required to hide what you feel, but bring your true self to work. These are very different terms than we've been using, you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago. There are some challenges. One is that at the end of the day, we sometimes need to have some tough love. So we have difficult conversations. Sometimes diversity comes with conversations that lead to conflict, that shake up our deep and implicit assumptions, that we didn't think we were doing anything wrong, but someone else was experiencing it differently. So it means having those difficult conversations. It means letting people go. Sometimes it means there's not a good fit, you know, and your expectations and the firms were just not really matching. So it's time to let them go. But also maintaining that positive culture as it changes. When I turn the stage over in a moment, we're going to hear from companies of very different sizes and how that's different when you go from a large company to a small company or when a small company grows and suddenly we need to think about things a bit differently. How do we do it? Top management has to be a part. Not the only part, but it has to be a part, both by providing the vision, also the resources. Managers, these could be investors, this could be middle managers, depends on how it is in your firm. These are people modeling the behaviors every day. Think about that flower. These are the people whose faces you're seeing every day at work. These are the people who are telling you the norms, who are correcting you, who are socializing you. Pay attention to these people as well. And HR. HR plays a very important role here in hiring the right people, but also holding them accountable when they violate the assumptions, when, they, when negative incidents happen that can change the culture or threaten it in a way. These are very, very important levels in terms of creating and building and maintaining that positive culture. What, is it, what does it take to be successful? This sounds very radical in some industries, but I think not this one. The first is moving beyond just the moral case. The moral case should be enough, and increasingly there's evidence that the moral case is enough, but it also helps to have the monetary case. And fortunately, there are a lot of us working in this area to really demonstrate the impact in terms of monetary. 
It can't just be HR. We need to partner outside of HR and move beyond the other. In, in every organization, it's a little different. Sometimes it's R&D, sometimes it's investments, sometimes it's operations. Moving outside of HR, selecting those middle managers carefully, and then cultivating a meaningful, authentic corporate culture. Don't just pick a culture off a can. Don't look at whatever firm that you really admire and say, let's do what they did, because they're different in a 100 other ways that's different than your firm. Um, and then encourage local norms. So maybe you've got a firm that's got offices in 100 different cities. You know, What can everybody resonate with? What feels like home, no matter which office they come to, whether it's Milwaukee or San Diego or you know, Hyderabad? Thank you very much. I'm going to turn the stage over uh, to our wonderful presenters. Um, I'm going to first introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Paige Ross. Paige is Senior Managing Director and the Global Head of Human Resources at Blackstone, where she oversees human resource management for the firm on a global level. Prior to joining Blackstone, she held senior HR leadership positions at Pfizer, Avon, and PepsiCo, bringing more than 25 years of experience in talent development and strategic planning, which she will be sharing with us now. Thank you. Thank you. So how many people were here two years ago? Great. So um, we, had, we had two senior leaders from Blackstone present, Vern Perry and Stephen Kahn. And they talked about their mentorship, sponsorship relationship that had evolved over the years. The two of them came from very different backgrounds, significant age difference, and yet they built this amazing relationship about personal and professional um, sponsorship and had worked together through the hard and the, and the easy times, although arguably the easy times led to just um, positive reinforcement. Mentorship from our perspective, both informal and formal, is senior people triggering and bringing people along with them, helping them, helping them survive and thrive in their workplace as well as personally. And so a key part of our culture at Blackstone is, is, is having that kind of supportive environment. And I'm gonna talk about that for a little bit today. But before we even go into that, I wanna just talk about culture. Now we just talked about the definition of culture. And so everybody, it's, it's the buzzword. What does that mean? So I did some research. And I looked up, and the New Yorker had an article a couple of years ago, and they talked about what are the different vehicles and what are the different buzzwords around it. And simply put, culture is the way organizations do things. And so I'm gonna to talk today about the way Blackstone does things. All right, so now I have to move this thing. Huh. Okay. So the top part is a, uh, is a quote from Stephen Schwarzman, our, our CEO and chairman. This culture of lifelong living and relentless innovation is what propels the firm forward. He started the firm almost 34 years ago, and those words are what's going to propel the firm forward for the next 34 years. We focus on attracting the right talent, and we've always looked for top talent, but now more than ever, we're looking for diverse backgrounds, which I'll go into in a little while retaining and developing. All we are is a people business. If you think about it, our assets walk in and out of the door every single day. We don't make widgets, we don't make soda. What we do is we have human capital. And so making sure that those people want to join the firm and want to stay at the firm is critical to our success. And then the impact. We all know that people now want to join a firm that has an impact both inside as well as outside, and they have a responsibility to the environment. To compete in this type of environment and for this talent, we have to get all three of these rights. And I would say that we're doing a good job on that. The last two years, we've gone into four new businesses. We've gone into infrastructure, insurance, life sciences, and now growth equity. You only can go into businesses of that magnitude in that short a period of time if you have a culture of learning and relentless innovation. Okay, I'm doing this the totally wrong way. Okay, wait. Okay, do you know how I'm supposed to do this? Which one are you supposed to go? Okay, there we go. Okay, here's a lot of words. So obviously I need to get a direction on how to use the clicker as, um, when I leave here. 
So if you look at the words on this page, this describes our culture. And I want to give a little bit of context. About two years ago, I interviewed about 50 employees across the firm from the most senior people through junior people to say, what describes our culture and, what and how do we think about our leaders? And I want to highlight a couple of them. One is player coach. We have no managers at Blackstone. All, everybody rolls up their sleeves every single day. Two is team orientation. We fundamentally believe that investing is a team sport. I get asked all the time, what about that brilliant lone wolf who can make incredible investment decisions? They'll have an amazing career, just not with us, because we fundamentally believe that teams make better investment decisions. And then the last one is nice. With, with most of us spending more time at work than we do at home, working with people that are nice and can pass that airport test is critical to us. And so we earlier today, we talked about scorecards. We have scorecards for all of our positions. And when we do recruiting, we have the what and the how. And how is equally as important to us when we're making hiring decisions as the what. So I wouldn't be an HR person if I didn't put up a slide that said attract, retain, develop, and impact. Um, it's just the way we're wired. And so I'm going to go into it a little bit. Um, and so it, please bear with me. So while there's no question that it's a more competitive environment out there and that we do want the best and the brightest, it doesn't mean we should be complacent. We get more than 22,000 applicants for 112 summer in internships a year, 15,000 applicants for 86 analyst positions. So we get the volume of applicants. What we still need to do is make sure that we're hiring the right people. So, as, 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 so we think that diversity inclusion is a key part of that. And I'd like to talk about how we think about it as fishing and um, going wider. And so specifically, what do I mean by a wider net? A wider net is where we combine our traditional recruiting techniques with, with videotape interviewing and artificial intelligence that we just started to pilot last year. And the goal of artificial intelligence is to help us with our resume review and making sure that it's gender and race neutral. What do I mean by fishing earlier? I mean going to colleges at sophomore year, a full year earlier than our traditional summer internship go, a plan goes. And we've introduced three separate programs, our Future Leaders Program, our Future Diverse Leaders Program, and our Future Women Who Code Program. All of them are focused on bringing people into Blackstone for two days their sophomore year, giving them exposure to our senior leaders throughout the firm, teaching them technical skills, having them build relationships with each other, and then keeping in touch with them from the springtime to the fall time when they're ready to apply for the summer internships. What does that do to us? It tethers them to Blackstone earlier. It tethers us to them earlier. They get to know about how a career at Blackstone could be an incredible opportunity. So we're having huge success on that. And so when you think about our future, it's, it's building our networks, it's building relationships earlier um, with students. Retain. Now think about what a company does. You spend so much time recruiting, and then those people can walk out the door. This generation of millennials, how many people do a ton of hiring for millennials? Okay, so they don't think about joining a firm as marriage anymore. They think about it as dating. So when I was growing up, I thought I'm going to get out of college, I'm going to get out of graduate school, and I'm going to join a firm, and I could see myself there for the rest of my career. This generation doesn't think that way. They think they'll stay at a firm as long as they continue to develop, they learn, and they grow. And so the impetus on the firm is to make sure that you provide that environment. For a firm, for a firm like ours, where we believe that we want to grow investors for the long haul, it means we have to engage in that with them all the time on a regular basis, and we need to make sure our managers are equipped for doing that. And it all starts with making sure they get the feedback and the opportunities. So one of the key ways we do that is making sure that they engage with their managers and they have a community around them. Develop. We have a comprehensive um, career path for our employees. One of the things that we do and focus on is on-the-job training. We call it an apprenticeship model. 
How many people have seen our video of, of Mondays at Blackstone? Okay, shoot. thank you, at least one did. <laughs> if you, I'd encourage you to go on the video, uh, to go on our website. What it shows is every single Monday morning, the firm's success is, depends on our investment decisions. And every Monday morning, our investors at every single level of the firm sit around a table and they talk about what's going on in the macroeconomic um, environment. They talk about investments that they're doing and that they're planning on doing. And everybody from the analyst all the way up to Steve Schwartzman sits around that table and everybody's expected to have a point of view and every point of view matters. And so we think of that as an amazing way for developing our young talent. So this is a pretty big, busy slide. What I want to highlight here is we fundamentally believe that diverse and inclusive workforce will make makes us better investors. It helps us avoid risk and deliver better outcomes for our investors. We are extremely focused on this. If you look at the last bullet, you'll see that we, hi we hired in the last three years, we went from 15% of our entry class into analysts to 40%, despite only 30% of the applicants were women. And so the goal is to make sure that we continue to focus on it. <clears throat> Hopefully through this, you've seen that this is a focus of ours and we're, and we're on a journey because that is the way we do things at Blackstone. So thank you. Okay, I would now like to introduce our next presenter, Mr. Horacio Valeras. Horacio is the CEO of Frontier Global Partners, a global investment manager based in La Jolla, California. He's the lead portfolio manager of three investment strategies, a global equity portfolio, an international equity portfolio, and a global macro asset allocation portfolio. He founded HAV Capital in 2012, which merged with Frontier Market Asset Management in 2018 to form Frontier Global Partners. Previously, Horacio served as the chief investment officer of Allianz Global Investors Capital. Horacio, please welcome Horacio. Thank you, Mandy, and good afternoon, everybody. We're a tiny bit smaller than Blackstone. <laughs> uh, we have 11 people. When Carrie called about having a speak, I said, but we only have 11 people. Um, anyways, um, Frontier Global Partners was really founded on the idea that, um, that we wanted our culture and we wanted, an, we wanted an inclusive culture and diversity was key to our success. Part of the reason for that is because we invest around the world and both Larry Spidell and I, who um, are, I guess, the senior uh, most members of the firm, we both started investing in, in China in the late 80s, early 90s. We started investing in, in Russia in the early 90s. Um, actually, Larry started investing in Africa in the early 2000s, long before a lot of people did that. And we really both believe, and the entire firm believes, um, and our, our investment philosophy being founded on behavioral finance, a culture and inclusion and diversity really does lead to good uh, success with our clients. So we start with a quote, with actually a definition from David Thomas uh, back in 1996. And this is really what we think of diversity. Diversity is a varied perspectives and approaches to work. We think diversity improves, uh, improves performance, but there's a lot of research out there, and we've heard a lot of it today, that really shows that, the that, that diversity, the, the results can be good, they can be bad. It really all depends on your implementation. So what we focus on is getting all our people, our 11 people, to work together so that we can deliver uh, value for our clients. Now, um, I wanted to start just with our values, and I'm sure a lot of you have these same values. You know, clients, interest, clients come first, we're here because of them, um, you know, ethical practices, respect, transparency, and so on. Uh, we believe that our combination uh, that we have within the firm and what we ask people to do on a day-to-day -day basis really leads to success uh, in these values. And we start, 
um, with really a lo long experience uh, for all of us in working in various firms. So this is just my background, and you know there are other people at the firm that have uh, similar backgrounds. I started at First Boston Corporation, and when Sally Krawcheck today was talking about starting at Solomon Brothers in 1987, that's when I started at First Boston. First Boston, the definition of diversity was that on Fridays you could wear a blue shirt. <laughs> Uh, I also worked for some smaller firms. Uh, when I joined Miller Anderson and, and, Sher and Sherrod, we had about 110 people. Uh, we had a very uh, diverse ownership base. It was very flat. The largest owner uh, owned about 11% of the general partner shares. Um, and that made a huge difference. That and transparency made a huge difference in the culture of the firm. I then went to Nicholas Applegate, which had been bought by Allianz, so we had this huge firm which we had to deal with multicultural uh, experience, particularly with our, with our German parents. And finally, I've spent a lot of time in uh, looking at different things in academia. I'm on various boards. Um, and, uh, you know, today, diversity and inclusion is really the only way that most academic institutions in the U.S. are going to succeed going forward. So our workforce, we start only 11 people, but they come from all over the world. And these stars are the people that, uh, where they come from. I tried to find someone from Australia or anyone who traveled to Antarctica. We unfortunately don't have those. But we have had people work at the firm or work there now that really come from every continent around the world. And we do this on purpose. We actually look for this. Uh, right now we're recruiting for an emerging market analyst and we started our interview process we, you know, we only get 250 applicants rather than 86,000 applicants. But the 250, we interviewed people that really were based everywhere around the world. And we're bringing seven or eight of them in. The one thing that hasn't worked, and you know, that's why I'm so happy to be able to be here, is our gender proportion in applicants was really skewed towards men. So we've actually delayed our search and gone looking for more people in other places to fix that. What do we do in practice to really implement, you know, I can think about these things and, you know, from the top down I can say, you know, we want to do these things, but what do we do in practice? Well, we hire people to become partners. Every single one of our, pers of our people today is a partner. None of them were hired as partners except the people that founded the firm. But the idea is that anybody, it doesn't matter what job you do within the firm, if you're willing to take a risk with us, we're a small firm, $400 million in assets under management, you should have a chance to become a partner in the firm and to contribute uh, to its success. Responsibilities are multifaceted. So our analysts are portfolio managers, our portfolio managers are analysts. We tend to hire people that can do various things. Even our operations people are partners. Um, all our investment research is done by generalists, and we think this is crucial. One of the things that I learned from my time um, with Allianz is that if you have a large analyst team, as a portfolio manager, you feel like you have to put a stock from every person into the portfolio. What happens is in 2008, financial crisis comes along, you have a well-respected financial analyst, you feel like you should own some financial stocks. You may be underweight, but if those financial stocks go to zero, as they did in 2008 and 2000 and early 2009, the impact on the portfolio is going to be significant. So we ask everybody to cover various different sectors, and we ask everybody to one day do technology, another day do healthcare, another day uh, look at companies in, uh, you know, one day look at companies in Japan, and then the next day look at companies in, in the UK. We have capacity limits on all our products because we do really put our clients first. And as I mentioned earlier, we recruit, recruit for partnership. So some people will tell us, well, you don't have enough people to do the research and the work that you do. We rely on process. We've put together what I think is a fairly rigorous process. We have screens which uh, reduce the number of stocks we look at, but we also have um, we also have very low turnover in our portfolio, so we don't need a lot of different ideas every day. And we rely on research. This is a, a study done by Ivan Steiner, a, a paper published a long time ago, in which he looked at the potential productivity of a group. And as you can see, it goes up to the right. The y-axis is productivity and process loss. The 
x-axis is group size. As the group size goes up, the potential productivity goes up. However, the process losses, because of miscommunication, because of you know, having different people uh, do the same thing and end up in different places, process losses go up as the group size go up so that the actual productivity of the group peaks with a relatively small group. And what we've found is investment teams of four or, or so is really the ideal size for us, and that's where we run things. The other thing we do is we, we recruit diverse educational backgrounds. So you can see all the different majors that we have with our people. You can see all the different schools they've gone to. Uh, most of them in the U.S., the one in China. And it's not what you would assume. The lawyer is not doing, is not our chief operating officer or, or compliance officer. Uh, the lawyer is actually one of our uh, portfolio managers. Uh, we also have a prof an ex-professional volleyball player that lived in China. He's Hispanic, lived in China, lived in Greece, lived in Turkey, lived all over the place playing volleyball. And he brings a very different perspective to us as well. Why do we do this? Well, we do it because the key is to deliver exceptional performance for our clients. And we think different ways of approaching the investment problem really leads to performance excellence in the long run. We also do it because we learn from each other. And we have fun doing it. But hopefully, we also do it because over time, we'll create value both for our clients and for ourselves. So thank you very much. OK, so we have some time now for a little bit of a fireside chat. You can just imagine the fire. Actually, you just need to go outside for the fire today. 104 last time my, my car was showing up. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists some questions that we put together that we thought would be interesting, not just to, you know, those of us who are working in this area, but to all of you all. So the first of all I'm going to ask about is the question that to me is on everyone's mind, which is the business case for diversity. So increasingly boards, investors, society at large are interested in the business case for diversity. So I wonder if you two could comment on what does that mean at your firm and, and what is the business case for diversity for small firms, big firms, other firms you work for? You want me to go first? Yeah. Um, so, well, for us, there's two business cases. As I mentioned, one of them is to deliver value added for our clients. And if people think differently about the same investment problem, they may come up with different solutions. They may come up with different views. Uh, beyond that, we actually ask our portfolio companies, or we, we look at what our portfolio companies are doing. Because as you know, there's a lot of evidence that's been you know demonstrated that um, diversity at the boardroom, diversity in the in senior management, and so on adds value uh, for uh, for shareholders, and that's important to us. However, um, the one thing that we have a lot of problems with is how do you define diversity? You know, we all here have a, a definition for the U.S. How do you define it outside the U.S.? Is it it's it's different? So so we're working on that now because it's a, it's a fascinating subject. And I would say we, we believe that um, diverse teams make better investment decisions. And so our business case is actually quite clear. It's we're an investment firm. We want to make good investment decisions and diverse teams help make it better. Um, in addition to it's the right thing to do. So it's, it's one of those, it's the right business decision and it's the right thing to do. One of the things we know about diversity is that, you know, it's kind of like that wonderful graph that you showed where the potential advantages, you know, are, are out there, but often things happen along the way that the potential is not always realized. Can both of you talk about some of the challenges along the way in terms of realizing that potential in a very real way to give people a sense of some of the bumps along the way to, to achieving that, that, that innate, uh, interesting diversity of perspectives, thoughts, backgrounds that might contribute to the bottom line? I would say for us, um, making sure when we bring people in at every level that we're onboarding them the right way. So there have been times when you bring in, especially at a senior level, you say, oh, well, that person will figure it out. Nobody figures it out. You have to actually help them. And so when I think about now when people come in, we have to have a robust onboarding plan. So that way we set them up for success right from the beginning. And when I look at um, things that we're much more conscious of, it's making sure we're building those connections. They know informally who are people that they can go to. And so we're much more conscious and purposeful about it. Yeah, yeah and I, I, th I think that for us, um, so, 
What hasn't worked? Well, I'll pull one from our from my university experiences. I'm on the board of Virginia Tech, and and a few years ago, we wanted to increase the diversity of our of our uh, faculty. Well, you can mandate that. We hired a director of diversity, as everybody has. You can mandate that, but unless it's really resident within each of the departments and each of the um, of, of the uh, colleges, people are generally have a tendency to hire the people that look like them, they, you know, that, that they feel comfortable with. So until you really drill it down into everybody, uh, into it, until it becomes part of where you breathe and, and, and live every day, uh, it, it really is much more difficult to do. Now, five years forward, we've done a much better job. But, but at the beginning, it was really difficult. Everybody felt like, oh, yeah, yeah, we need this and this and this, and everybody were hiring. But then they would pick the person that looked and behaved like them. And that's a very good point. It's a, it, if you go back 10 years, it was an HR issue. So it was HR was responsible for diversity. It, that never, ever works. It is a business. And the business leaders have to believe it's the right thing to do. And HR is there to support it. But it's not a HR solves for it. And how does it differ when you're coming at it from a more top-down perspective versus a bottom-up perspective? Because we've all seen where, you know, the board says, you know, okay, guys, we need these numbers, go make it happen. And we've also seen initiatives where, you know, affinity groups pop up. So how do you see those differences? And can you provide some examples from your firm of, you know, either or both happening? Yeah, for our firm, it has to be both. Um, so we do have affinity groups. We have four different affinity groups um, that that are grassroots, and they have really taken a life um, that, uh, of their own over the last ten years. But John Gray, who's our president and COO, he travels, he goes to meetings, and if he looks at a table that does not look diverse, he's the first person to go to the leader of that and say, "Okay, I, next time I come here, that better not be the case." And so it is absolutely top down and bottom up. I think either one without the other doesn't actually work. Yeah, and uh, for us, with the number of people we have, bottom up and top down is exactly the same. <laughs> 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 because it doesn't make that much difference. Um, you know, you basically have to have to push it every day. You have to uh, you have to live it every day. You know, I talked about our, our recruiting for for an emerging markets analyst. We we want to make sure that that we get the you know that, that the whole pool that's out there that we can that we look at. Uh, but um, and then and then we have those people come in and you know somebody talked today about giving him a, a kind of like an exercise. So you take out the the emotion. You take out the you know who they are and what. Uh, where they come from, so we make them all present on you know research that they've done, and we give them some guidance as to how to do it, so that we're looking at everybody on the on the same uh, on the same level, um, and I think that that goes a long ways to try to remove uh, some of the biases that people have because all of us, I mean, we all have biases. It's really hard to get past them. Well, actually, on that note, can you guys talk about the different ways that we can think about diversity that might move beyond just the example you gave of the table looks different? I mean, what are, I know some of you have really approached diversity in really unique ways. Can you talk about the different ways we can think about diversity and how that shows up in some of the work that you do every day? Yeah, so um, so we look at it. We try to look at it in all different ways. As you know, as I presented geographically, we. Every one of our people, well, all our people except one who actually spent time in a submarine, uh, lived in other countries. And and for How us, much time did he spend in a submarine? He spent three years in a submarine. <laughs> but uh, for us, that is uh, that's actually very important to get people who 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 have spent time in other places. Um, we also. Um, we also, uh, you know, our partners are from age 25 to 78. So we try to be diverse in, in age. A lot of times you find, you know, nascent investment management firms, it's people that work together a long time. They're, they're the same. They're, they're, you know, we, we looked at, at, at bringing in an emerging market team. People had worked together for 15 years. They were all had grown up together, basically. And in the end, we, we couldn't get, we couldn't get there. Um, so, so our, you know, there, there's diversity of age, there's diversity of uh, educational experience, there's diversity of background. Um, you know, we have people that grew up, you know, in China in a relatively poor environment. We have people that 
uh, that came out of, you know, out, out of other, for example, you know, my family came out of Argentina, a country that's been great with its currency over time. So I have a lot of experience with that. But, uh, you know, so, uh, so we look for all those different things in addition to the, you know, the Hispanic and, you know, African American and Asian and so on. I echo everything he said. I, one of the things that we've, we're focusing a lot on is giving different experiences. So we're, we're very much like if you're in our real estate business, the chances of you spending time in different countries and working with different teams um, is something that we're spending, uh, we're, we're focusing on sending our high potentials out because we want them to get diversity of experiences and working with diverse teams in different countries. And we think that that actually helps them um, be more uh better investors, actually, because they get different viewpoints than getting on and off a plane and spending a couple of days. You talked about some of the challenges, you know, being the application pool. You know, you can have the best of intentions, and if the application pool's not there, um, what are some other challenges that you faced along this journey of trying to stay with the times, but actually stay ahead of it, knowing that there's this untapped potential and diversity that everybody really could take more advantage of? Well, it's, it's interesting that the whole thing around the application pool, and I, and to me, it's just math. So we had 15,000 applicants for 86 openings, even if a third of those are women, that's still 5,000. So if I do 5,000 and I say 86, I think I can get 50%. I mean, so I, I, I recognize and I, and I believe that the applicant pool may have been, you know, making sure you, you do the net wide is important, but you have to be very purposeful about saying, we're going to make sure that we have uh, the right candidates and that does look like a diverse population. And so anything less to me is just not acceptable. One of the things I do every year is, uh, is I judge the CFA Global Investment Challenge in San Diego. And um, one of the things that worries me the most is that we don't get enough women in, in those teams. And, uh, you know, I know we had a CFA session here yesterday, but um, I, I think that that's a, crucial, that's a crucial piece of it. And that's why, you know, as I mentioned with emerging with our emerging markets position where the gender uh, balance just wasn't there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's something that we really have to work on as, a, as an industry because, uh, because we're, not, we're not there yet. Yeah, and I think that's part of why we, we've started our, our, our programs in sophomore year. It's that people can understand, we want to tap into people that they understand they can have a great career in financial services that they may not have traditionally thought of doing. And what about, so, so, so we're succeeding at the applicant pool where it's at. We even get them to sign on. Maybe we sign them sophomore year. We, we got them. Um, what happens when they get to the firm and then we want to keep them? So what are some of the challenges and successes that you found keeping people at the firm, knowing that it's a competitive market, you train them, you recruit them, and then, you know, the last thing you want to do is lose them to a competitor, to someone else, to their own firm? How do, how do, what are some successes and challenges with that? Well, particularly for us, you know, if we lose a person, that's 10% of, your, of our work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, we've lost a few people over time and we've lost them for different reasons. Uh, one was uh, a person that we weren't moving fast enough. So we learned from that. Um, another one was somebody that wanted to live somewhere else. And, you know, it, when you have a small firm and you, and, you know, we did, we did open an office somewhere else, but it didn't work out over time and we lost her. But uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, it's kind of hard to work by yourself somewhere else. And that's, that's a problem with having a small, a small organization. Um, the hardest thing for us is, is really, you know, for particularly some of the, some of the younger people is, is to really um, get them you know, a lot of them want to go into high tech. They don't really look at financial services today as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a career that's, you know, doesn't have the glamour that it had in 1987 when I started. Um, so, so convincing them that they can have a, a, is probably the hardest thing. Yeah, and, and for us, it's listening to them. Um, I think that, you know, when I, was, when I was out of school, you sort of went to a firm or a company and there was more paternalistic. You had faith that the company knew what you wanted. This generation, um, they want to be engaged. They want to have a voice. And so I'm the first one to say, I don't know all the answers. I listen to what's important to them and we pilot a lot of things. And so, and the other, one of the things that we're finding is that feedback is critical. And so the thought of losing somebody because they didn't know where their career was and they didn't know how they were doing is 
ridiculous to me. So we're just making sure that we're building an environment of continuous feedback. One of, one of the things that, that we do is we, we get people involved in, in not only, you know, we hire them as analysts, but we get them involved in the portfolio management. We get them involved with our clients. They can talk to, they can talk, you know, can participate in meetings. They travel to conferences like these. The, the, the whole idea is to give them a broader career path and particularly with millennials, which, which is, you know, was stated earlier, you know, they're, they're dating. They're not, they're not uh, marrying a company. Uh, it's it's hard because there's a mismatch in expectations relative to what we saw when we were right. when we were uh, starting in our career. So we have to take that into account. Yeah, and for us, it, it, you know, when we look at our most senior partners in the firm, 25% of them started as analysts, and that is our goal is to continue with these long careers. So that means you have to engage with them all the time. You can't just say, well, they're different, and so forget about it. Like that is our future, and so we have to do it as a partnership. So you talked a little bit about about culture in your slides, and and you know both of you sort of you know made the joke that it probably looks a little similar. Everybody's got you know there was actually a research study that ninety two percent of corporate manifestos can be boiled down to like more or less the same six. How do you signal as a firm something about your culture that is both authentic, but that also makes it seem like a place that someone could join to start their career, they could have their voice heard, you know, and maybe that doesn't happen in, you know, recombining those six, but what, what can firms do to really signal kind of their true corporate culture and why this would be a good place for them? Yeah. Um, I always joke that, you know, we could either Google culture and get those same six things or we could pay somebody a quarter of a million dollars to help us come <laughs> up with those, with those same six things. Um, you know, we're all going to put our clients first, or at least we're all going to say we're going to put our clients first. Uh, but, uh, but the, um, it, you really have to live it. I mean, they have to see it. When you hire somebody new, they got it. They have to know that you're going to do things the way that you say that you, that you're going to do them. And so, so if something, and, and when you really test it is when something goes wrong. Um, you know, we had to restate a return on one of our, on one of our funds. And so the question is, do you just, and we had a withdrawal. Do you just restate it or do you actually give the shareholder that you told them what they were going to get? And then you put the money and you take the money out of the firm and put, pay it into the fund. So to make sure, make everybody else whole. And so we, we actually did that. And that showed some of our younger people that, you know, it's not all about, you know, what's on the bottom line, but it's doing the right thing for clients. So if you don't do those kinds of things on a day to day basis, um, they're just, you know, it, they're just not going to believe it. Yeah. I, th I think that it, what you, what you do is actually what people say. And so for us, um, if you, if, if anybody thinks about Blackstone, they would think about innovation. And this whole entrepreneurship, you know, Steve, who again started the firm over 34 years ago, he would say he's still an entrepreneur at heart. And so the people that he talks to, and and we and we, as we think about going into new businesses and growing, it's always in that spirit. And so from the early age, um, when people join, we actually reward that. And it doesn't mean that everything works. It's more of they're creative, they're innovative. Those are all things that if you join our firm. Um, is pretty standard. And I, I found that even when I first joined, I thought, okay, here's this great successful firm. I can't come up with anything that, that's new or exciting. And they're like, no, no, no. They're like, don't assume because we've done it. It's the best way to do it. Think about different ways. And so we challenge ourselves all the time and we expect it from the most junior people to the most senior people. And how does that differ between big firms and smaller firms? Because you, you gave a great example and, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious that they're seeing the top senior leaders behaving and that's very impactful. It's much more difficult at a large firm. There are many layers, there are many divisions. How do you keep everybody on the same page or how do you, what level do you target to make sure that some of those values are being enacted across the divisions, across all the levels? For us, it's funny, um, we're 2,600 people, but we act like a small firm. So every single Monday, they're around the table. And so those layers don't actually exist. We, we do investing in a small team environment. And the thing that we have changed, um, and I heard this expression once, it's like you never want to be that firm that says, if Blackstone only knew what Blackstone knew. And so that's like the 
never want that. And so part of what we've done is spent a lot of time thinking about informal um, networking events and informal ways for people to get together. And when we're doing investments, we're doing more cross teams. And so we're trying to, we're making sure that people know each other. So as we get bigger, it doesn't feel bigger. And for the finance industry as a whole, what's specific about making the business case that might differ from some other industries? I know Paige, you've been in a few different industries. You know, you've been in a lot of different firms. How does the business case for finance and investing differ a little bit? And how is it in some ways clearer how to make that case for everybody in the room who's wondering how to take this back to their, their context? Well, I think um, we, we are constantly looking at very different things. So to have the different perspectives, uh, whether you're looking at a, a company in the UK that may, may you know, uh, invest in call centers, or then you're looking at a mining company out of Australia, or you're looking at, at even Apple in the US. You're, you, we're, we're looking at so many different things that on a daily basis, the world is different, that to have the different perspectives is to us essential to be able to end up with the right investment decisions. And that's not to say, I mean, you're gonna get, in this industry, you're gonna get 45% of the things you do wrong. You, you know, maybe 40, but you know, hopefully, but, but you really need those different perspectives, uh, particularly when you're analyzing really a, a very diverse world. And so for us, it's, it's just part of what we do. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I think for us, it's, um, it's part of what we do. It's critical for other industries that I've been in. They were in different stages in their journey. So I think financial services, um, it hasn't been as far along as some of the other industries if you go back 20 years. And so I think right now there's a huge focus on it. And the goal is over time for it to be something you don't even talk about. It. It's just part of who the firms are. And that, to me, is success. What do you see? Um, it's a great point and a good example of how, you know, depending on how far along the industry is, you can see real differences in terms of how taken for granted it is that diversity matters, that diversity has an impact. Um, what do you see in the industry going forward in five, 10 years? And how can farms get out, get out in advance of that to say, you know, this is what I've, you know, I've been in this industry a long time. I've seen trends. You know, here's what I see going ahead. And, and here's how we can move toward them more proactively. I think it's focus. Um, I think, you know, we can't, nobody can claim success. We need to focus on making sure this is a, str a strategic imperative of the firm. And over time, you'll, you'll, you'll get to the place where we all want to be, which is when you look around, it's a completely diverse workforce. Um, and so I think I would caution anybody to call, to call success too soon. And I'll, I'll answer that from my other perspective, which is from, from the academic side. There's a lot of evidence that, you know, we're getting a lot more underrepresented um, people, people, first generation college students, uh, you know, different social economic uh, groups getting into universities and getting those university degrees, which are crucial to succeeding in the finance uh, industry because, you know, we're, you, you really need that background. And, uh, and you know, we, we have moved a long way. We're not quite there yet, but, but the, the good universities are, are doing a, a good job of, of creating that talent pipeline that we all need. But it's going to take some time. And we, have to help, and we have to help develop that pipeline. So it is training people earlier. And it is providing an environment that if, if you come in, it's not a sink or swim. And you're supporting them. One of the one of the puzzles we have in the literature on diversity and performance is that often the most successful firms are also the most diverse. And so the idea is that if you have a lot of resources to devote to it, it's easier. What advice can you give? And maybe this is directly to you, Horacio, for for smaller firms where maybe you know all those applications going to Blackstone, you you, you know you'd like a couple thousand coming your way too because you would have a great career. And who doesn't want to live in La Jolla? So what can we do? <laughs> what can we do to reverse that trend to say you know come to us? And by the way, we can show that diversity makes a difference because we've seen it. You know we we're, we're not so huge that we just can have yeah. some of the well, levers. Yeah, we have we have certain biases. You know, obviously. Uh, Small firms can perform better at times and at times not so well, but um, small firms can, can have a more cohesive investment philosophy. We have one investment philosophy that carries across all our products. 
Um, you know, hopefully over time it'll catch on. But but uh, you know, the end in the end in this industry, really what what matters is what you do for your clients, not only in terms of investment results, but also in terms of client service. And whether you have a diverse firm or not, if you can't deliver on those two things, you're not going to be around for for very long. So so that's what we focus on. We think it's the way the way to get there is to bring as many different viewpoints into the equation as possible. Uh, but time will tell. It, it, it's, it's an interesting point because we're, at, we're talking about it as if it's separate. It's actually part of the investment process. It's not, it's, it's, if, you, if you're fundamentally doing investing and your teams are diverse and you're going to deliver better results, it's not on the side. It's, it, it's integral to how you do business. Um, and and we, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be I'd be remiss if we left the great example you provided about you know the brilliant jerk. I mean we're all we're all in financial services oriented toward you know to some extent dollar signs in ways that other industries might not. How do we deal with the brilliant jerk? And what have you seen, not necessarily at your firms, but in your experience about how firms deal with that and what that reveals about their culture in terms of the the hidden part of culture that only comes up in these you know sort of extreme examples. I don't, I don't think it's hidden. The brilliant jerks are not hidden. If anybody acts like they are, they're not. Everybody knows who they are. Everybody could see them. And you have, and, and everything you say goes out the window when they get promoted, when they get reinforced. Yeah. And so I've, I've been at places, not at Blackstone, but I've been at places where they say, oh, we don't tolerate that. We don't tolerate the jerks. And it's the jerk telling you that. Um, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, and so it's, your culture is not worth making, take, taking that into jeopardy. So we just don't play in that. It's just not worth it. I, you know, I, I had an example when I got to uh, to Nicholas Applegate. Somebody said to me, "You got to watch out for this guy. For this guy, he's you know very good investor, but he's a total jerk." So I worked with him for many years and got him to tone down. Um, however, when I left, things kind of went back the other way. <laughs> so, but uh, I, you know, you can't tolerate it. I mean, that cold, how how people fit into your organization is crucial. So for us, when we're hiring. It's a six month process and we're not hiring that many people, but we're taking our good long time to get to know them. And you always take them out to dinner, feed them some wine or beer, see how they act. Because that's when their <laughs> true, true self comes out. <laughs> yeah, well, power, power and alcohol. And, um, well, on that note, I'll say thank you so much to our, our, our guests. Thanks all of you for being a wonderful audience. And uh, I'm sure we'll be around later if anyone has follow up questions. Thank you very much.